rather than making a nice presentation of it. Um, I, but I post a lot of work in progress on my blog. But they tend to be messy, so it's kind of like it's less embarrassing to just stand here and point to stuff than it is to show my photos in progress because they're full of dust and sometimes selfies of me wearing the respirator and stuff. Um, so I've been working with Reef at the Pop Series in Canada since 2009. Uh, soon discovered in 2009 I have a nice allergy to it, so I will discuss some safety uh, along the way. Um, all the hard parts of this costume are made of fiberglass, including around the star. Um, normally I'll use it for armor, but it also does, it works very, very well to make into a putty to create organic shapes. Um, sorry, so before I begin, how many of you have worked with fiberglass? Even uh, polyester fiberglass, usually? The really sticky one, the one that's got the tiny little bubble as a catalyst, yeah. Yeah, it, uh, epoxy is quite different. We're for um, polyester resin. It's a catalytic, catalytic reaction, which means you can use only a tiny drop say an accidental transfer of the catalyst into your main uh, resin and it will eventually completely go off. Um, sorry, that's the term for curing. Yay jargon, things you learn from boat builders. Um, so I worked with epoxy because I found it the cure time and work time a little bit longer and helped me sort of work around casting and, and molding issues here in Auckland, which is not not conducive to a lot of bombing, like urethane. How many of you have used urethane? Isn't it fun? Oh no, uh, I don't know if Wellington's quite as wet. Auckland is very, very, very damp. Um, humidity causes problems for epoxy curing as well, um, painting, and, and uh, yeah, urethane casting. Are there any questions to begin with? Because I'm going to just talk about wider applications of fiberglass first. Is there anyone? Okay, cool. Um, epoxy resin is widely used in the marine industry to build yachts. My brother is currently in Dubai, where he wants super yachts using very similar materials to what I'm talking about today. So um, part of the reason why I work with fiberglass, even though it hates me, is it is a transferable skill. It's not you don't just have to use it for cosplay. You can build yourself a surfboard. You can modify your car. You can build a super yacht if you get a nice big commission. Um, it's also it's used for all these applications because while it is very strong, it's also slightly flexible, um, so it's not liable to crack. But also it forms really great chemical bonds between its various layers, including paint systems and glow systems, which quite often all come under one manufacturer's like West Systems. Uh, Pretty much the go-to for um, the marine industry. So you start off with your resin, which is a two-part. Uh, the part A is you use four parts, and part B you use one part. Sometimes it's a little bit different. Voice systems I find really, really fiddly, but ADOS and the New Zealand um, company who work through trade me under the name eBorg Five. Um, they've got a really good product for prop making. Let's put like this, I've got a helmet made from fiberglass that I dropped on some exhibit of tiles a couple of years ago, they have glass, you know, the underlid, and as I saw my helmet fall off my head, I went, oh my god, and it bounced. <laughs> it literally bounced up and there's no crack or anything in it. Um, I'm just going to put this down. about to take my horns off. So the base plastic is the, the two parts. You mix that and you wind up with a kind of yellowy clear goop and over the course of about three or four hours it'll cure. Full cure is within about 48 hours so it is a very slow cure so I don't recommend um, doing a rush job in the last few days. 
Once you've got your base resin, you can mix in that uh, various fillers. Capacil is quite a well-known one. It will make the, the liquid work almost like creamed honey, and you can brush it inside your molds to get some complex shapes. You can also use a microballoon filler. West Systems sells some of them. Uh, they're actually probably the main seller of microballoons, and you very definitely want microballoons. Incredibly light. You work it in to create a very, very light putty, a putty you can actually again balance. And that's what I've got all over my staff. You can also mix pigments into it, straight up pigment, pigments from the art store. If you go to Gordon Harris or any other shop, you'll find that display of pigments, usually near the oil colours. You can literally use that. Ideally, you mix some of that with a little bit of part A of your resin to really work it through, and then you can work it through the rest of your pasta. And next we come to the part that um, actually gives fiberglass its name and strength, the glass. Uh, how many of you have felt by accident the insulation wall inside your house? Isn't it prickly and ghastly? That's spun glass. It is actually glass. It's silica. It's the same thing as cabocil. Um, so they are literally glass fibers. This is about the only material that will work with fiberglass to create a strong bond. The um, fibers absorb the plastic and sort of swell and then they create molecular bonds right the way throughout your entire piece. So had one of these horns been cast as a single piece, it's essentially one chemical, one, one molecule all the way from the tip to the base which is what gives it its incredible strength and flexibility because those bonds and those molecules are so long that they've got that flex. Unfortunately, as is the case with a lot of in real, uh, real world applications, what you'll actually need to do is build up in layers. So you won't have the same strength going, if you imagine this being a cutaway piece of the shell. You'll have, um, instead of the molecules going all the way from top to bottom, you'll have laminated layers like this where there are strong bonds, weak bonds, strong bonds, weak bonds, and so forth. And this is true for when you're building a surfboard or a boat, or again modifying a car. So the matting you can get as matting or as cloth. Cloth is a little bit less easy to work with because it is actually woven up and so it's quite a sturdy fabric. It's not as prickly as the, the matting, but it will resist you um, unless you really, really pre-soak it. So for example, if you're trying to go around a curve, it's probably better off to cut your cloth into strips to the edge and, and then carefully match up and then sand the edges off. The resin will connect the two pieces together, so it'll still be nice and solid at the join. Any questions so far? Okay, cool. So the next thing is, there are some uh, uses of other materials to create a basic shape, but not add to structure. For example, I'll talk about car modifying again, because that's where I got all my information from. Uh, you start off with your, the back of your car, you put some wooden struts in there, and you staple lycra into the curves that you want, and you stretch the lycra to create really lovely, sweetie shapes in the background. And you just paint a layer of resin on that, and you leave it. And that's your base support. It is fragile because the um, fiberglass somehow breaks the, the fabric underneath. I've used felt, I've used stretch fabric, I've used plain fabric and it all tears. Um, so it's still brittle. So you use that purely as a support layer to then fiberglass over with your matting or your cloth. And you build up a few layers depending on how much strength you need. The other handy thing about using epoxy resin specifically is you get your support your structure, and you can even paint uh, 
the outside of this is painted with a very, very thin layer of resin that I then sponged off and airbrushed the green iridescent pigment onto. By airbrush, I mean I put the powder on a small container, put my sponge in it, and uh, put myself in my sponge. <laughs> Airbrushing, it is, yeah. Function airbrushing or when your airbrush no longer functions because you've got too many other products in it. Uh, fiberglass is also very easy to sand back when you've got a filler in it, especially the micro balloons. In fact, if you're going to use micro balloons, be prepared for your first to be a little bit more brittle, um, but a lot lighter. The Cabasil works as a filler helps create a little bit of lightness, but it's still fairly dense. But it retains the flexibility because it's the glass. I'm going to take these off because this is one of the unfortunate problems with fiberglass. It's not the weight. Oh, that feels weird. Um, while I was staying in my hotel room at night, I put these in the windowsill and they have shrunk the curve on the inside has shrunk a little bit. They used to be, um, the horns used to be, uh, they stuck out on the side. You might see an indentation on the side of my head. Um, can possibly, you can possibly see inside multiple colours. I did a base, um, a base cast. In, with brown pigments so that I'd know when I've reached my innermost layer and know not to cut any fur. And over there were um, greys and, and black tinted so that I could at least have a baby horn colour on the outside. Any questions at this stage? I might have glossed over. Cool. Okay, um, these are slightly heavier than they should be because I built up the back of these horns um, by hand, making putty like I did for the, the uh, staff. And now I talk about safety. Uh, epoxy resin. You will know if you are having a sensitivity to it within a second. I have scars. I have bled from the rashes that I've had from this. So. It's not completely evil, um, but you do need to be incredibly careful to make sure you wear coveralls that are plastic, not the dust ones. Uh, vinyl gloves and latex gloves, uh, two layers. I seriously recommend two layers because your fingernails will poke through. Unless you get those lovely black nitrile gloves, which are awesome. And I highly recommend a respirator. I've, and goggles, safety goggles. I've got a half mask respirator and safety goggles. Again, gifts from my brother, so the industry standard. It's like, <laughs> save 300 bucks the year. Because the yeah, good safety care is quite expensive. Um, you will need it uh, while you're working because sometimes it gets very splashy and you don't want to get it in your eyes. You don't. Sorry, yes? So when you're sourcing a half mask, yes. is there a particular type of filter that you have to go for? Um, it all depends. There are two filters you should use. There's one which is for organic compounds and technically it does fall under that whole area. But while you're actually working with cutting and sanding, you'll need a dust filter. Dust, um, so you can get masks with, that can interchange. And that's what I've got. I have to tie the headband on, but you know, it's second hand, it's great. Yep. Uh, would you recommend like a specific model, perhaps? No, um, I've only got what my brother's got given me, and I think they're 3M. But there's also a really nifty uh, sort of swap, you know, pick and mix, sorry, pick and mix option. I know Mitre 10 sells them, and they come in Systema boxes, as it is, which, and so that's really handy because those kinds of Systema high-stick boxes, everyone's familiar with from the supermarket, that resists fiberglass, so you can use it for mixing and you can pop your um, leftovers out, throw it away and reuse it. So recycling, yeah. 
one of the really critical things with those masks is the fit of the mask. So particularly people with facial hair like mine, if it's a bit longer, it's almost impossible to seal. Um, so yeah, just make sure that they seal properly. Um, Vaseline is also, I know it sounds crazy, but Vaseline is fantastic. It's the death of latex. But if you do need to seal around the edges of a mask or actually just put on as a barrier cream, highly recommend it um, because you just don't know where the resin might wind up. I've lost my eyebrows because I've gone afterwards. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> Free waxing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and sometimes I'll find it in the back of my hair weeks later. And, oh, hang on. How, how did that stay in there all that time? because it doesn't come out with washing. Um, so along with safety is cleanup. I highly recommend a plastic drop cloth as if you're going to paint. Definitely don't use um, cloth drops or anything like that because it will just soak through and glue the drop to your carpet. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff glued to each other in my workroom. <laughs> And the floor has an exciting pattern of droplets that I haven't cut out of my carpet. Because that's the other thing, epoxy resin heats up as it works. Really heats up. I usually use little paper cups to measure because they're really accurate. Here's a 200 mil paper cup, awesome. And I will use 200 mils at the very least, um, you know, four times, five times to you know, cast one horn. But if you leave it in a small confined space like a paper cup, be prepared. It will smoke, it will bubble, it will rise up like a souffle and at that point you go, oh crap, oh crap, oh crap, get metal tongs and put it in the middle of a driveway on a big puddle preferably. I haven't yet set anything on fire but it's got very, very hot. <laughs> Hence why I'm not doing any demonstrations in here. Sorry, yes. You do need um, ventilation. So I'm very lucky. I have essentially a one car garage to work from. So I can work, do all my resin work by the doors so I can get some airflow. And then I usually work at night as well which means I finish and then I run out of the room and close the doors and I don't have to deal with <laughs> the smells or the neighbours. But outside is definitely better for ventilation unless you've got a great vent top set up where you've got like a vacuum and a uh, yeah, proper little box for getting airflow, which is, you can create and build, but um, it's probably better to, to work outside. Just be warned when working outside, You'll suddenly discover what trees are in, in pollen. You'll discover lo what your local insect population is because they'll all wind up on whatever you're working on. I think there is actually a sand fly in here somewhere. <laughs> uh, that usually is for paint work more than anything, which is. But yeah, ventilation is very important. Um, like I said, the, the odors or the vapors are classified as organic, so not something you want to be breathing in. All the time. Any other questions? So if you do discover you get itchy and it's not because of the cloth, um, highly recommend talking to your doctor saying getting it on your file because it's a type of sens sensitivity that doesn't diminish with increased exposure. You know some sensitivities you can actually get rid of by mild exposure. No. No, this one gets so bad that you can't go on planes anymore, so do watch out for it. I haven't got to that stage yet, but I sometimes, with the dust from this, it will irritate my skin. So, antihistamines, loading dose, and dose afterwards, and the next day. Um, you, you might be able to hear I have allergies anyway. This is a brand new exciting discovery this year, so I can't tell when I've got stuffy nose from dust or, hey, my body's decided it's allergy, it's fine. Um, so also a nasal spray, a saline only one, because sometimes you will get dust up there, you will get dust up there when you're sanding and polishing.
washing. Uh, it cuts back really easily with sandpaper in your hand. The kind of sandpaper I prefer to use is actually used for belt sanders. You buy it by the meter, it's got a really rigid cardboard back. It means you can fold it or roll it up and get, get a really good grip and you know just cut away. I'm onto my second Dremel on these. So, uh, I technic technically killed my Dremel on my shoes, which was to uh, remove, well, cut them back, but pieces of plastic got caught in the housing in the motor, and I could hear it rattling around until I couldn't. <laughs> um, the dust will get everywhere, I mean everywhere, so I highly recommend sanding outside. <laughs> Your neighbours will love you. Um, if you sprit uh, also if you're using a hand sander, like a little mouse sander, the dust will fall straight off, it won't fly about too much, and it's great, so you can just sort of sit on a drop cloth in the sand and then tidy that away. But when you're working with a Dremel where it's dust everywhere, um, you're good luck. Um, it's probably as best to invest in a little work area, like create a box station with the vacuum cleaner attached into it so it draws all the dust away. But do be aware, the dust is super fine and it might even wind up in the engine of your vacuum cleaner, so don't use someone else's. <laughs> I might have killed my own vacuum cleaner already. So, are there any questions at this stage? Uh, so, these organic cartridges for the filters, how long do they actually last? They vary and that depends on the manufacturer, so I always read the manufacturer's advice. For example, the Dremel comes with a warning that basically says, beware of the contempt of the familiar. Uh, if just because you're used to this machine does not mean it's not still dangerous. And it is. Very good um, advice for pretty much anything, especially when working with resin. I mean, I'm super familiar with it, even I still, you know, Eight years later, we'll um, make mistakes and get it splashy. Oh, while it's um, curing and it's getting going through that hot phase, it gets very jelly-like as well. So you might want to watch your props in case it all slumps off. <laughs> and I've done that too. Um, I made a 50-inch Black Widow rifle from Mass Effect. And it's a hexagon shaped barrel and I thought, oh, okay, that's great, that's nice and geometric, it'll stay on there. Um, I wound up using, being able to only do a side at a time, well, top half, bottom half. Because the weight of the resin and the matting made it fall off. In a, a long, sorry, I know I sort of have jumped about a bit. And talking about matting and glass, you can buy carbon fiber cloth. Please be warned, this then takes your prop out of being fun and into um, possible police inquiry because carbon fiber obviously is used for body armor. So you might get some looks if you try and bring something <laughs> through the airport. Um, these went through okay, I'm really surprised. Especially with my bone dagger <laughs> and the bread skulls. Um, but yeah, this is essentially plastic, so so long as you keep your points quite blunted, you should not have too much issue with security because they'll realise very quickly, oh, it's plastic, um, not bone or wood or metal or anything. Um, as you can see, it does nice wood effects, um, animal effects, wood skull, and it's extremely good for armour, um, depending on the creators of the armour model, of course. Uh, Bioware, I'm looking at you. <laughs> Butt cheek plates, obviously. <laughs> um, so there are some armours where fiberglass really is not a good option, but the part of what makes it a really great option is if you get a mannequin, you can cover it with Vaseline, then stretch some uh, lycra over that uh, paint layer of your uh, resin over it, pop it off, and use that as your base for creating a female-shaped armour, or even male-shaped armour, or I wouldn't recommend kitty-shaped armour. 
my kitty cat gets dressed up, but not to that extent. Um, but yeah, so the base for these horns were created by a very similar process I just described. I vaselined a head cast I had done on myself. I don't recommend it, unless you're incredibly... I know my levels of claustrophobia, and I would not be able to handle somebody else putting goo on my face. Um, I had to play three musicals, have my room chilled out before I could even contemplate doing it. Um, yeah, getting straws into my nostrils for a while. <laughs> I'm trying to put plaster on your face, not great. However, I've now got a head cast off my head, so these actually fit perfectly, except for my set. I've left these in the sun and they warped a little bit. The other, the upside to making a fiberglass though is you can heat it back and it doesn't tend to, um, this is the up and down side, it doesn't work quite the same as regular thermoplastics because, you know, get it hot, it will deform, that's how I get the horns out of the moulds. But it will go back to its original shape unless you shock it into remaining in another shape. Any questions at this stage? Sorry. I just wanted to discuss in a little bit more detail the techniques you use on your staff. Okay, I'll do the head first and then go to the staff. Yay. Um, for my head cast, I knew I wanted a fiberglass cast because it's quite light, huh? um, and I, I don't know what chemicals will adhere to it and what won't. The main, you usually use UltraCal to make a face cast because it's porous, which means that clay will stick to it really well as you're sculpting and then once you've taken the clay pieces away it works really well for uh, the materials used for making prosthetics like silicon, like foam latex, like actual latex um, but it's also shatter, you know, it will shatter if you drop it and I have a nearly 7kg cat who likes to, if he doesn't get his attention, he will walk along a surface and go <laughs> and he'll look up and, and he will push it off quite deliberately so I try and make my everything cat proof or toddler proof um, so to make my head cast by myself I first did the plaster shell and I have a previous head cast which I also did myself which is a Silurian sculpture at the moment so I just put the plaster straight over knowing that there would be a gap between the plaster and my face. S uh, stood up the alginate, laid it inside the plaster about an inch thick, took a deep breath and uh, worked the straws through the nostrils. That was the longest process. And by the time I got to that point, the alginate was mostly cured, so I only had to have it on my face for 30 seconds, if that. So, ideally have other people However, I know I would have freaked out if I had to have had that stuff on me for any longer. I'm very, very claustrophobic. And then once that was done, I powdered the mould just to make sure that there was no surface uh, wetness. And then brushed up with the first layer of resin and built up. It wound up being a bit heavier than it was supposed to because the back of the head deformed slightly, so I had to reshape it a little bit on the inside. Okay, so the fit out certain ways. It's best if you are going to work with alginate for yourself to make head cast, to make stuff like this in oh the epoxy works really well in alginate. Urethane doesn't, but uh, epoxy does. It'll just have a little bit of surfaced stuff that you need to wipe away. So to work and create the organic shapes, okay, safety is very paramount. Uh, you will need less resin than you think you need. So again, I, I work by paper cups, so I work out one paper cup at, at a time. So, you know, sort of working out the three-quarter level and then putting in the hardener. And with epoxy, you can use a little bit of extra hardener will speed up the curing process a little bit more, but it won't interfere with the bonds. 
which is great. And then you'll wind the volume four times filler to resin because it just soaks it up. And at that ratio, you will have something that feels a little bit like, um, off fondant, possibly, icing fondant, very similar, sort of squish, squish, and sticky. And it's at this point that you use a lot of water because um, water inhib inhibits epoxy, so it won't uh, cure past the point of the barrier of water. So I essentially use my bags, um, dip them in water, cook the putty, and just smooth straight up the, the wooden dowel so that there was some that was embedded into the wood grain. And then wash my hands again. Um, warm soapy water, kind of like when you're working with silicon cooking to make molds. And then, yeah, just pushed it around with my hands. Um, yeah, and then ran to the bathroom and just, yeah. For cleanup, you will need a lot of acetone, so this, is, this can be quite hard on your hands. There is an amazing commercial grade orange oil cleaner. Not the stuff that might attack cells or anything that's that sort of blue, sort of mid yellow, oh, sorry, mid orange. Commercial grade orange oil cleaner is the best because it's not harsh on your hands, but it will uh, remove any res residue of the resin that you might get on your hands. As you remove your gloves, as you remove your coveralls, you will get transferred somewhere. Which is why I have several bathrobes that are now workroom robes. Because they just it just gets stuck in the fires as well. Yeah, it transfers. So are there any more questions? Yeah. Would you have any tip for anyone trying to use epoxy with negative moulds? Uh, yes. Um, for negative moulds especially, epoxy will slump like the blazes. So if you've got, um, say, half a head cast. Part, that, that part, most of the resin will run into the area of your nose. So do a very, very thin layer of the resin. I mean, even less than a paintbrush layer. Mix up some capsule, especially, and brush that in and smooth that in, and that will not sound quite as badly as any other filler. And then you can also buy chopped strand mat something that I like to, it's little short pieces of the glass, about that long. And so once I've done that, I'll just throw handfuls of this in there and then pack it against the side because that helps create shorter bond, even more bonds, kind of tricks it into thinking that the top surface is cured, so everything else underneath cures against the side of the wall. Just don't use too much at a time. Um, <laughs> uh, for the horns, because it's a silicon inner and fiberglass mother, it sort of joins together and there are sea lines along the side. Actually getting an even coat on something as complex as that is really difficult. So I do recommend Cabasil for pretty much working with any organic complicated pieces in a mould because it will stick to itself and then you can carefully prise them out and you know, work out where your weak spots are, pop them back in the mould, pour in some liquid and, and slush it around. But yeah, horns like that are particularly tricky because there will be areas where it doesn't, they're not even and that's part of the reason why they're so heavy is I've got some heavy bits right at the tips. Going to uh, searching for boat building type things.
and because they will they will tell you the safety gear, the materials, and the the chemical specifications. Because there are also different kinds of epoxy. There's marine grade. There's a new wonderful that I want to get my hands on, which is UV resistant. So it's actually crystal clear, crystal clear, and um, uh, able to be worn out in the real world. Yay. As far as the contest is concerned, this is safe so long you don't make it pointy and sharp and you sand off rough edges. I can't tell you how dangerous those rough edges are when you're actually first casting. You will have fibres sticking out everywhere. I've even wound up going, oh, I had some rough edges on a mould that I was working with. Oh, I don't need to wear my goggles for this job, I'm just, just washing my mould. And they, because these little rough edges are kind of flexible as well, I went ping, and I got some clay in my eye. That's, that's a fun one to explain to you, Doctor. <laughs> it's not pink eye on this, but it is because it's transfer from it's an infection in the eye, so. Yay! Antibiotics and cream. So, yeah, safety gear is paramount, it's not my stuff. But the stuff that it produces is long lasting and as I said it will be it will change a little bit with heat so you can use it to get into something. Um, one of my first projects was the infamous slave layer bikini. And in order to actually get into it, uh, go sideways, slot it on and turn. And if I set it in a sink in hot water that was just soft enough to get up my ribs and not snap. So yeah, so heating up your fiberglass to, to fit on a particularly difficult piece is doable. Um, and over the course of the day, the heat of your body will help keep that malleable from when you want to take it off again. Um, the heels of my boots are also fiberglass. Um, they are assembled together with shoe boo though to allow for some flexibility like normal boots. So yes, it is incredibly versatile. You can make animal parts, wooden parts, armour. Sorry, I don't have any examples. I, you know, the one time I decided, oh, let's not do any armour this year. Is the day one I remember. Oh, we're doing a fiberglass panel. Um, for armour, uh, you probably have heard of the term pepakura. Yeah, it's essentially just a, a flat pattern moulding program. The, work is in the mock 3D model that you then flatten out. For working with Pimakura in Auckland especially where it's very, very damp, I recommend using um, architect board. It's actually two layers of thin card with a very, very thin layer of foam in between. It gives it rigidity and I glue it together using Yoohoo glue because it's fairly fast setting. And then once you've got your first layer of resin on the outside, that's stable enough to, to keep working. My Shea Vizsla armour, which I haven't worn for a couple of years, the thigh pieces and um, arm braces are made from 5mm card and it's got one layer of fiberglass on each side and it's incredibly sturdy, very, very light and actually really comfortable. But getting those shapes to stay be stabilised is very important because once you've started resining, you can't fix any warping. And the same thing with surface warping as well, you might have to fill. <laughs> Anybody got the time? Sorry, just that I'm not going into. It's 20 to 3. 20 to 3. Okay, so last chance for any more questions? Oh, yeah? Uh, I was just wondering, you were talking about the travel, uh, like packing up, and does that start like detachable at some point? Is it, like, it is. Have um, like, you got any stories about just, like other problems that you've got that you like, had to figure out how you're going to ship it? Yeah, um, I didn't take the staff to Melbourne because I was a bit worried about, uh, you know, figuring out that it's wood and, you know, getting a bit picky. I always get you've been selected for uh, the body screen or explosives. So you know, I have to say quite often, up and handling glues and um, just clean my hands with hand sanitizer so I might set it off. Um, but this is actually cut halfway 
And because it's wood, I've been able to get away with using, again, Yoohoo glue to hold it together. It's basically just holding itself together. Uh, for other pieces, they come into uh, other panels that other people are doing. So I use, um, if I'm using plum plumber's pipe for uh, stuff or something like that, I'll use the same uh, screw sets that they use. Also PVC, so you can set them back and use the treat them, uh, get them to like the same surface. Again, back to my snowflake costume, I had the full vibro axe, which is six feet tall, and I had to cut that into four parts, I think it was, to, to put it away from travel. For the horns, um, I was absolutely terrified, so they went into a hard shell carry on case, but knowing that I was travelling internationally, I figured they wouldn't like this little knife, those horns, and then bird skulls, you know, actually more plain and accessible. So I put everything inside that little hard shell case, and then put that inside another hard shell case. And I put a big letter on top of the inner one saying, Hi! <laughs> I know this looks really weird, but it's all plastic, I promise. Um, so that's another thing to, I, gen I genuinely, recommend if you're traveling with props made of fiberglass because they will show up strangely on the x-rays and they'll still show up their silhouettes so yeah seeing my slave eye bikini going through the x-ray machine was very weird it was like, oh, actually you can see every curve um, so if you've got anything that looks like animal parts or looks like it could be used potentially to hurt someone uh, definitely put it through your checked, la checked luggage with a note explaining they are costume pieces, they are made from plastic, but here's where they are in my suitcase. Um, and include a photo. <laughs> Was your luggage okay? Because like, I've been hearing stories about Homeland Security, them just going and breaking locks and yeah. people finding that either parts of their costumes are missing or broken because they're not they're seriously not being gentle with this stuff, yeah. they're just going poof, poof. I recommend learning um, luggage Tetris. Um, don't put things like, like say with the horns, say <clears throat> a horrible accident happens and they shatter. It's best not to have them in the same area as some delicate fabric because it'll cut through the fabric. I know somebody travelled with the SCA, which is medieval good and some of her pottery shattered and it went right through all the lanes of her luggage, destroying everything. Um, so when I went to America, I had bubble wrap around everything and I carefully stacked things so that soft was on rigid and rigid was on soft, so there was no... But also that it was really obvious how to put it back together again. Because, yeah, sometimes people don't know how to put them back together again. On the subject of locks, if you travel, if you do really feel you need to lock your case and you're traveling by air, look for a TSA proof lock. The TSA can open those locks yes. and put them back without breaking them. A lot of new suitcases have those where you put the ends of the zip to the lock that's built in. I recommend just leaving it set to triple zero because then they can just open it. They, just, they use their little key to open it and then they snap the key. They do put the ends of the tabs back in place but if they've done that and you've forgotten your code uh, it's like just leave it because it will reset to zero, so, zero. Um, also some airports I haven't noticed it here but some airports overseas will allow you to basically glad wrap your bag mm -hmm. um, on site so that means that you know immediately if it's been tampered with I didn't go for the option in that one, I figured I didn't really need to, but as a word of caution, it's probably a wise idea because having weird stuff in your suitcase already um, can make people, you know, customers and TSA look at you a little bit more harshly. I didn't have any problem, as, and I was, I flew from New Zealand to San Francisco, San Fran to Orlando, Orlando to Atlanta. And then the trip home was Atlanta, Dallas, Fort Worth, is San Fran and back. So I had the domestic flights in America as well, which are exciting. And 
I didn't have any trouble, but also I know, like I said, I played luggage Tetris really, really well. And because they're things that I've made and I've got patterns for, I'm not terribly concerned if something happens on flight because I can replace it. And that's one of the nice things about um, making stuff at home yourself and materials you can get on hand readily and really quickly. And um, yeah, the Ados epoxy is quite pricey. If you buy it from somewhere like Mida 10, it's something like $50 for a litre kit. If you go online, you can get a five litre kit for a hundred. So, yeah, it's, it's a lot cheaper to go to the fiberglass shops. And because there are enough of us in the cosplay community and the um, commercial industry using epoxy and urethanes and all that, they won't be, they'll be pretty patient with you saying, hey, I'll use this for a costume, but I don't know what to get. They'll probably be able to recommend because they, they deal with so many customers who do use it for costumes. So, I think that's, I think yeah, that's it.